Hi, everyone. So my talk is just a summary of a quantitative imaging method that's currently being used both in diagnostic imaging and radiation oncology here in Queensland and across Australia. So first, the quantitative imaging is generally about discriminating between objects in an image beyond what we can visually perceive and characterizing those differences or the objects themselves. In the context of medicine, this kind of information allows us to do non-invasive diagnostics, treatment planning, and evaluating treatment response. MRI, unlike other common imaging modalities, doesn't use ionizing radiation, has superior soft tissue contrast, and um, can potentially um, can characterize the microstructure and function of tissues. Um, there are some downsides in that it's more expensive, um, it's uh, harder to maintain, and um, not all patients can be scanned. More traditional MRI exploits differences in the spin relaxation properties of different tissues to achieve desired contrast. And then usually a radiologist will do a qualitative comparison between those signal intensities to do a diagnosis um, of a pathology. For example, a T2-weighted image can be um, created using a scanning protocol that optimizes for contrast between cerebral spinal fluid, gray and white matter in the brain. So this would be useful for looking for abnormalities in cerebral spinal fluid um, or abnormal distribution. On the other hand, diagnostic imaging provides information about the microstructure and potentially the function of tissues by measuring the movement of water. In diffusion weighted imaging, the image contrast is um, from the variation in the rate of water diffusion between the tissues. The pulse sequence is similar to the T2 weighted image that I showed earlier, um, except that there's additional magnetic field gradient pulses that are applied to induce additional signal loss um, due to the rate of diffusion happening in those tissues. So this um, signal loss is basically due to the water molecules changing their position by the time that that signal gets acquired. In this diagram, the blue lines represent the normal MR signal decay that happens as a function of their characteristic T2 relaxation properties. And the red line is the difference in the additional MR signal loss um, due to the diffusion gradient pulses that get applied. So at a certain point in time, indicated by the yellow triangles, um, you can see that the signal loss due to faster diffusion processes um, is greater at the top and slower diffusion processes will result in less MR signal. So um, faster diffusion processes will generate um, darker signal in a DWI, whereas slower diffusion processes will look brighter. The diffusion gradient conditions are described in terms of a term called B value, which has units of seconds per millimeter squared. And this depends on the gradient strength, the duration of the pulse, and the timing between those pulses. The actual formula for um, that B value depends on the shape and design of the gradient pulse and varies between vendors, but what the vendor will actually display is this B value. A DWI image created with a B value of zero means no diffusion gradient pulses were applied, and it's basically a standard T2 weighted image on the left. Um, if you go to higher B values, the image will appear darker because now you're left with most of the signal that's coming from slower diffusion processes or tissues that have um, more restricted diffusion. At even higher B values, the signal to noise ratio gets worse because there's not much signal left, and so noise also becomes more apparent. DWI is also inherently T2 weighted because of limitations on the timing of those pulses and acquisition by adding this diffusion gradient pulse. So some areas will appear brighter simply because of their T2 relaxation which um, is relatively longer than other tissues such as fat. So additional techniques are used to suppress um, tissues, signals from tissues with longer relaxation times such as fat suppression. And this is called T2 shine through. So to confirm whether 
there is abnormal diffusion processes happening, another image called an ADC map is used, uh, is generated from the DWI. So ADC is the parent diffusion coefficient, which is used in MRI to quantify the degree of diffusion in a voxel. For water molecules that move freely in space, the MR signal attenuation is due to um, the free diffusion as described in the equation at the top. So basically the variation in MR signal for a sample of water measured under two gradient conditions, two, B, two different B1 values, follows a single exponential. And this equation can be plotted on a log scale, which is basically a straight line, um, the red line for um, free water. So in DWI, these principles that govern the free diffusion of water is used to study tissues. And um, so the diffusion of water, however, in tissues is more restricted. So this equation doesn't give the true diffusion coefficient in tissues, but is an approximation. So in the clinical context of MRI, DWI, this um, coefficient is referred to as the apparent diffusion coefficient. The plot on the left is an example of DWI signal intensities as a function of B values for the brain. That's where most of the research has been done. It's been found that B values higher than 1,000 centimeters per millimeter squared results in signal differences deviating from linearity. And this data is also less reliable at the higher B values because you have poor signal to noise ratio. So in practice, clinical DWI for the brain is done at a maximum of 1,000 to optimize signal to noise ratio. The straight line is also reproducible up to a B value of 1,000. So ADC maps of the brain are typically generated with a B value of zero, which is basically a standard T2 weighted image without any diffusion gradient pulses and a B value of 1,000. In the literature for ADC maps of other regions of interest, other than the brain, the ADC is calculated using at least three DWIs acquired at at least three different B values. And that's because you need at least three data points to fit a straight line. And often more than three B values will be used to more accurately fit um, the data. So for lack of time, I'll just show one now common clinical application of DWI and ADC maps currently used in diagnostic imaging here in Queensland. So a DW sc um, scan is typically done to query a stroke. There is a type of stroke that is characterized by loss of or limited blood supply to the brain, and it could be from a blood clot in the brain or further down. If that blockage isn't treated, brain tissue won't get enough oxygen and nutrients to function properly, and tissue would eventually die. So the longer a stroke is untreated, the more likely um, that permanent brain damage can occur. A DWI scan can detect a stroke that's occurred within the first 36 hours better than a non-contrast CT scan. It can also distinguish between an acute stroke and um, approximately how long ago a stroke has occurred. For example, when no one else was around to witness it. This is important for people who experience a stroke, for example, in their sleep and they wake up and they don't know what's happened and when. So again, different treatment and intervention is done based on what kind of stroke, when it happened and the resulting state of the brain, how much brain damage has already occurred. So clinicians can make better decisions and management for patient care. DWI is also used to detect hemorrhaging, cysts, infections caused by inflammation, or other pathologies that lead to abnormal distribution or restriction of fluid in the body. The other major area of advancement is in using DWI and ADC maps for diagnosing treatment planning and evaluating treatment response in oncology. Water movement is more restricted when tumor cellularity increases, and so a large decrease in ADC is generally associated with a higher degree of tumor malignancy. So in this example of endometrial cancer in the pelvis, multiple DWI images were generated using different B values, and then data from two B values was used to optimize the ADC maps and suppress the diffusion from fat, which is a very slow um, diffusion process, and the very high the very fast diffusion processes like blood flow in the blood vessels that they weren't interested in. And they measured significantly lower ADC values in the endometrial cancer than the surrounding tissue. For several years now, researchers and clinicians have been working to validate 
and inter the interpretation of DWI and ADC for specific cases of cancer and treatment methods. In Australia, there have been prospective studies on using DWI in oncology for a few years, and now one of those oncologists actively pursuing functional MRI is based at SKU and also works in the private clinics. There's also um, publications from the Wesley Hospital a few years ago on their work on using DWI and ADC in prostate cancer. And more recently, there's been collaborations across Brisbane between UQ, QUT, TRI, PAA, and Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital in using DWI to measure treatment response. Given the amount of effort and interest in this type of imaging, I thought I'd just summarize the major challenges and things to consider for using ADC maps quantitatively. So the first one is um, the way that ADC values are calculated and compared. There's different ways that can, this can be done. One way is to compare the global mean ADC value over a region of interest over time. And there are significant um, differences in mean ADC from selecting slightly different ROIs. So in this example, the green and red area areas have an absolute difference of 0.1 in ADC value, but the percentage error is over 10%. So a solution to this is to automatically transfer the same ROIs across all the images that are um, acquired over time, which other studies also do. Um, the use of the, main, the mean ADC value is also ideally for homogeneous <coughs> tissues, but tumors are often heterogeneous with components such as necrosis and cystic parts that can contribute to higher ADC values. So another um, option is to do a histogram analysis of ADC values across the area of interest and compare the changes in the distribution of those ADC values over time instead of just using the global mean ADC. There are also um, other factors affecting the baseline signal before the diffusion gradient pulses are even applied. So the literature shows significant differences in ADC values between the different scanners, gradient systems, RF coils, and even the software used to calculate the ADC or the alg algorithms used. One way of dealing with this is to determine ADC thresholds that are site-specific or clearly state the conditions and limitations um, of a certain setup or method or also correct for the differences between scanners and setups. And lastly, I just um, wanted to touch on where we're headed with all of this. So validating the use of DWI and ADC, I think, is only going to become more important, especially when it comes to cases where CT and PET poorly image, for example, in the pelvic region. And part of the clinical use of DWI and ADC for the brain was made possible by readily available QC phantoms that validated the interpretation of this. Um, there aren't really any commercially available phantoms for other organs, so the development of phantoms and QC work in this area is also important. Most of the statistical analysis done in the literature is looking at the statistically significant differences in ADC values, but the ADC map is generated by at least a T2 weighted image and a DWI image. So um, these can also be taken into account when you do an ROC analysis rather than the ADC map alone. There are also other quantitative parameters that can be calculated from multiple DWI images based on um, better models that represent diffusion of water and tissue as opposed to the free diffusion in, for example, a, a container. Um, so those kinds of other parameters are also available on, for example, Siemens through, I think, their research packages. Um, so yeah, so why not take into account all the other information that's acquired to achieve higher sensitivity and specificity by doing multivariable ROC analysis. And finally, the theory of water diffusion in different tissues is not well understood, and the underlying mechanism causing ADC values to either increase or decrease hasn't been confirmed or established. So if we truly want to do functional imaging, then we need to understand um, and confirm what's happening at the molecular level and the biophysics and biochemistry that play into the signals that actually get measured. So to summarize, a lot of the work, there's a lot of work being done in this area, but there's still a lot to do. And so um, I'll just leave the references that I've mentioned here, um, the work being done in Queensland, in Australia, and the group that kind of first proposed using DWI, and leave you with that. Thank you.
any questions?